Salvation Now podcast, where you'll discover and be equipped with keys from the Word of God that will pave the way to God's unlimited blessing in your life. Now, here's your host, Evangelist T.J. Malkanji. How God promotes. How God promotes. I want to start out this broadcast by reading Psalm 75. You can't talk about promotion and the law of promotion. Understand, the reason why I'm doing these seven steps to take in order to receive divine promotion is because there are steps to take. Promotion is not an automatic thing. Promotion is not man-given. Promotion is not something that falls on a few lucky people. There are buttons to push to trigger off this promotion, this divinely inspired promotion. So it's not... Uh, some random uh, series of events that just randomly occur that lead to promotion that God just, you know, I'm having a good day today. Hey, Charles, you know what? You're going to have a job. You're going to have a job promotion. Or I'm going to promote you in this area. Whatever area of life that you're seeking promotion or increase in, God doesn't just randomly select people. Remember, God is no respecter of persons. What does that mean? It means he doesn't show favorites. He doesn't have personal favorites. He doesn't have one person that he has over another uh, favor or favoring over another there's not people he loves more than others uh, but there are people who do things that tap in to what God desires to do for everyone but he can only do for the though for the for the select few that that actually tap in to those areas you know the Bible says it, without faith it's impossible to please God for he that comes to God must believe that God exists and then he's a rewarder of them that do diligently seek him. So there's this process. The reward doesn't just come to everyone. The reward doesn't just fall on everyone. There are people who have taken the necessary steps to take in order to receive, to acquire the reward. And today we're talking about promotion. Psalm 75 verses 6 and 7. Listen to what the Bible says. So, every, you know, this, the reason why I'm doing this today is because I've heard way too many preachers come out and say, don't worry, keep hanging on, keep holding on, your season's coming, your promotion's coming, God's about to lift someone up in this place. And they use these, like, vague statements, these broad statements for everyone, and everyone says amen, but there's certain people that are going to taste and see of that promotion and others that aren't, because any area... In life, that you're ignorant as to what the word says about that, promotion, healing, uh, financial blessing, whatever it is, any area of life that you're ignorant on as to what the Bible says about that area, you've disqualified yourself from partaking of the blessing of God in that area. And that includes promotion. God does not just promote anybody at will. There are people that have done the necessary things to do to trigger off that multiplication, that increase. And remember, God wants to increase everyone. The Bible says that uh, very clearly in in Mark chapter 4, that the kingdom of heaven is like a, a seed that a man went and sowed. He did what he needed to do. And when he did the steps, when he took the steps necessary, then he went to bed. He rested. He didn't worry about it. He left it up into God's hand. He did everything he knew to do to cause that seed to grow. He watered it. He fertilized it. He did everything to do that he needed to do. He went to bed by night. He woke up by night, by day. And the Bible says the seed sprouted and grew. How? He himself doesn't know. But it did grow. First the blade, then the grain, and then the full head in the grain. And he went and took the sickle and brought it in for the harvest had fully come in. There are people who don't understand the seed time harvest principle. And as a result, they struggle unnecessarily. God doesn't want you to struggle. God doesn't want you to strive through life. Jesus actually said, come to me all that are weary and heavy laden, and I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you another way on how to do your life, how to live life. There's a different way. Remember, we are kingdom people. We can operate by kingdom rules, and as a result, we can tap in to kingdom blessing and kingdom promotion. You don't have to listen to your backslidden aunt that just says, you know, life's just hard. 
life, life, life just throws you lemons. Just got to make lemonade out of it and just fall into the, the system of the world where life is hard. Remember, the Bible says the way of the sinner is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're not following the word and instructions in the word, life will be hard for you. The Bible says many sorrows shall come to him who hastens after other gods. When you're not in tune with the Holy Ghost, the Bible says sorrows come for free. You don't have to do anything to, to live a sorrow-free life. The Bible says very clearly, he that sows in righteousness will have a sure reward, but he that sows in sin will bring strife to his life, will, will attract and magnetize trouble to his life. To the sinner, trouble comes for free. But David said there's another way that you can live your life. He that makes the Lord his shepherd. He doesn't have to lack a thing his entire life because God's going to lead him by still waters. God's going to make him to lie down in green pastures. He'll lead him by his righteous paths for his name's sake. He restores our souls. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Doesn't mean nothing. nothing's ever going to come and challenge you, but even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, his rod and his staff, his word and his spirit are going to comfort you you and bring you to the other side. Yeah, he will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That no matter the enemy that's been assigned to destroy you, God can prepare a table in a wilderness. He can prepare a feast in a famine. He can prepare a blessing in a time like we are living in today where there's incredible uncertainty. Look, people, economic anal analysis. You have uh, all kinds of people that are predicting terrible things for the next 10 years. But you want to know the secret? You can, because you walk in covenant with God, you have a covenant exemption where God will actually, in the midst of people falling, in the midst where people are saying there's a casting down, God said, I'm actually going to cause a lifting up for you. You don't have to go the world's way. You don't have to go down. You don't have to, to, to like the Bible says, uh, struggle. And, and, be, and live a frustrated, stagnant life. You can live a life of glory to glory, victory to victory, and faith to faith. But it's not automatic. And it's not just, well, I got saved, praise God, all these things are going to come to me. No, getting saved is step one. And we'll talk about that today. Getting, getting born again, that's step one. That's like you just got enrolled into school. You, you got accepted into the university. You're now accepted in the beloved. But I can tell you from personal experience with my dealings with many, there are many people that are saved, good-hearted, well-intentioned Christians, have a great heart, love the Lord, love the lost, want to see people saved. But because they're missing certain secrets that have been revealed to us in the scriptures, this book is a bunch of mysteries that the Holy Spirit unravels and reveals to people that search and seek after its truths. Remember, Jesus told the people, he had thousands of people following him. And he said, to those that are outside, all things are given in parables. So that seeing, they'll see, but they'll never truly understand. But then he looked to his disciples who were hungry for the word. And he said, but to you? It's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To those that are outside, the curious onlookers, the ones that just, you know, in church, their hands crossed. They're just there because their families always come to this church. They're not really interested. They, they, they spend one hour a week in church and the rest of the week, they're just, you know, they're just doing their own thing. They listen to more Tony Robbins than they do read the word and all that. And they're just doing their own thing. To those people that just are curious all things are in parables. They're never going to truly understand the, the, the mysteries of the word of God. But to those who seek and search for me with all their heart, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, they will find me. Proverbs 4 says, the word of God is life to them that find it and healing to all their flesh. So there has to be this exploration mindset that you have when you approach the word of God. You can't just be the person that chews gum and sits on the sideline just like, you know, you go to church and your head's like, your mind is 
or you're watching a broadcast like this and your mind is on, you know, what you're going to eat for lunch or you're at church and you're wondering, you know, who's going to win the football game this afternoon. Those people receive nada. They receive nothing. They continue to live the Bible says, away from the way of understanding, and as a result, they rest in the assembly of the dead. But to those that press in, remember, Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent are taking it by force. It's a violent spirit. I'm not talking about a physically violent, but it's a, 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 a lively, violent, aggressive spirit exploration mindset that people have that say, I refuse to do life the, re the way everyone else is doing life. I refuse to just have this book being some sort of entertainment material, some like Time Magazine where I read just to, to find solace. No, this book is a book of instruction. Joshua 1, don't let this book of instruction depart from your mouth. It's a book of instruction. Remember this, the Bible is not a book of promises. It is a book of covenant promises. Prom if I made you a promise, then no matter what you do, I've got to fulfill my end because I'm a man of my word. If I said, I promise you by Tuesday, I'm going to give you $100. Well, by Tuesday, whether you slap me in the face or not, I've made you a promise. And if I'm a man of my word, I'm going to give you that $100. God's a man of his word. But listen to this. Joshua 1 says it's a book of instruction. And in Ephesians 2, it says a covenant of promises. Covenant is different from just promises. Covenant is if you'll do your part, if you'll follow through on fulfilling your terms of agreement, God will follow through and do what only he can do. A covenant is a contract between two or more individuals that guarantees once your part of the deal is fulfilled, once you've ticked off the I agree to the terms and conditions and you follow through with carrying them out, God is going to install his blessing in your life. Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. Listen to this. For exaltation, promotion, does not come from the east, nor does it come from the west, and it certainly doesn't come from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one, and he promotes or exalts another. He puts down one, and he promotes and exalts another. Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 2. So understand this. You're promoting, like if you're looking for a promotion at work, you're looking for a promotion uh, uh, at your job, in your career, whatever. You're looking for a general promotion in life, whatever the promotion you're seeking to have. You have to understand this. It's not, the man is not the source. Your boss, your employer, they're not the source of, you can have a boss that hates you. But because you've secured God's favor and you've done everything he's told you to do, it doesn't matter if your boss said in a back room somewhere, I will never promote them. I hate their guts. I'm waiting for them to slip so that I can fire them. If you've done everything to please God, God can circumvent your evil twisted boss and get right to you and lift you up. That's what the Bible says. He prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. It doesn't mean he's going to wipe out your enemies. He'll let your enemies watch. He'll let your enemies exist and stay and see the lifting up that only he can do by his, his strong arm. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, listen to this. My, this is Hannah. Hannah who was believing for uh, her, her womb to be fruitful again. She was believing for promotion in the area of her family. And for many years she, had, she, she was struggling. For many years. Her, uh, her husband's other wife, Penina, kept mocking her and kept mo uh, sc uh, being scornful towards her and kept degrading her. But one day, see, that's all it takes. Remember this, Joseph, the Bible says, the word of the Lord tested him until the word came to pass. And in one day, he went from the prison to the palace. In one day, he went from being the, 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 the shame of Egypt he went from being a convicted serial rapist, because that's what he was convicted of wrongfully. He, can, he went from being uh, the object of shame and reproach before Pharaoh's sight to then becoming the prime minister of all of Egypt. It doesn't take long. Hannah, in one day, 
She went from being a, 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 a woman who was depressed, on the verge of giving up, hopeless in her situation, until her word came to pass. And Eli said, by this time next year, you'll have a son. And she arose, wiped the tears off her face, and knew that promotion came from the Lord. And this is the song that she sang. This is what she prayed after hearing that word. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn or my strength is promoted, exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. If I can do anything for you today from this broadcast on God's promotion and his system of promotion, it's to turn that frown upside down. Nothing might change for you today immediately. Some of you might. Some of you might be an overnight thing. But nothing might change immediately for the next week or even the next month. But what I want this broadcast to do is instead of you being terrified of the things that are arrayed against you, instead of you focusing on the challenge and the, the obstacles that stand in the way of your promotion, instead of that, you begin to smile at your enemies. Oh, hallelujah. Philippians 1.28, Paul said that you are in no way to be terrified of your enemies, but rather you should rejoice in the Lord. For this serves as a sign to your enemies that they're going to be destroyed, but a sign to you that God's going to lift you up, that salvation is coming your way. Hannah said, even though nothing changed, she started, instead of treating Penina, who was, you know, treating her very uh, contemptuously, instead of re re retaliating and being bitter towards her, she started to smile at Penina. Why? Nothing changed on the outside. Penina kept on running her mouth. But the good news is, is that a Hannah had a word from the Lord. And she began to smile at her enemies and rejoice in the God of her salvation. I believe God from this broadcast, that frown is going to be turned upside down. God's going to make you to rejoice. God's going to make you to joy. Even though the fig tree's not blossoming yet, even though there's no fruit in the vine, even though you're not seeing anything materialize outwardly, God is going to put a new song in your heart. And as a result, as you refuse and reject fear, refuse and reject depression, refuse and reject the bitterness that's, that, 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 that's, that, that you may have had. From today, God is going to put you on an upward and forward trajectory. God's going to make your feet like the feet of a deer to ride on the high places of the earth in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you believe that for yourself, why don't you put up a few hand emojis, type one in the chat. God's going to do something for you today. I tell you, God is a good God and today is going to be a good day for you. Today is going to be a good day for you. Gone are the days of sorrow of heart. Gone are the days of depression. Gone are the days of hopelessness. You know, David said this, why so downcast, oh my soul? I believe that some of you tuned into this broadcast right now and those watching on the replay, some of you have become hopeless and hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. You've become sick and tired. You've become hopeless. You've become weighed down because you've been waiting and waiting and waiting and it's seems like nothing's changed. Well, I'm here to tell you today, maybe nothing's changed because there's been something, a loose connection that from this broadcast, God's going to, God's going to reveal to you. And as you tighten up that loose connection, you're going to see unprecedented increase. You're going to see quick and accelerated promotion, not by the hand of men for promotion comes not from the East. It doesn't come from a King. It doesn't come from a government. It comes from the Lord. And I see the Lord Lord's hand lifting you up. Humble yourself, the Bible says, under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he shall exalt you in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. God, David said, why so downcast? Why are you hopeless, oh my son, my soul? Hope in God. Some of you have to learn. You know, because you can listen to this for an hour and then turn off this broadcast and then get around some people that are going to say the opposite. And they're going to try and discourage you and weigh you down again. But you have to do like David did. You got to learn to speak. He said, why so downcast? Oh, my soul. He spoke to his soul. David did that. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. 
He didn't say, hey, when I feel like it, I'm going to bless the Lord. He told his soul. He told himself, I'm going to bless my, I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to bless him with all that is within me. You got to learn sometimes when you feel hopeless, when you feel hope deferred, when you feel, when you feel, if you go by your feelings, you're going to be a confused, distraught individual. But if you'll start to look in the mirror in the times where you feel hopeless and the times that you feel frustrated and start to say, the Lord is on my side, the Lord and the God of my salvation is my helper. He is the lifter of my head. He is my crown and my glory. He's the one who doesn't disappoint. Neither does he leave those that trust in him ashamed. He said, if you'll trust in me, I will lift you up. I'll never cause you to be stumbled. I'll never cause you to be frustrated. He said that I'll be your strength. I'll be your helper. I'll, I will sustain you with my righteous right hand. And you start to look at yourself in the mirror and say that and start to speak to yourself, speak to your so you'll see very quickly that the 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 sorrow or the depression or the onset emotions of hopelessness will quickly vanish away quickly some people let those feelings of hopelessness dwell far too long you can't stop a bird from flying over your head but you can stop a bird from building a nest in your hair you can't stop thoughts from crossing your mind you can't stop a feeling of hopelessness or a feeling of frustration from crossing your mind but you certainly can take it the moment it pops up and cast it down boot it out of your life remember your mind is not your master your mind is your slave you don't have to just let you know i can't do anything my mind just runs well trip it up Cause it to stop running. It doesn't have to run. You can take dominion over your mind and take authority over the thoughts. The Bible says take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's what Hannah did. Nothing changed, but she took every thought captive because her word came. No one's holy like the Lord, for there's none besides you, nor is any, there is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. That's why I'm, I'm about to go through these seven actions that you can take. The Lord God is a God of knowledge, so he knows that you're frustrated. He knows that he hears your groaning. He hears, he sees your oppression. He sees that you want to, you want to move forward, that you're, you're tired of being at the same place. But the Bible says by him, not need is weighed. If God moved by need, then every, there would be no needs. He'd just meet everybody's needs. God doesn't move by people's needs. God moves by people's actions. By him, actions are weighed. That's why I'm going to give you seven actions you can take today that's going to quickly provoke God's, God's promotion plan for your life. The bows of the mighty are broken. And those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. And the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven. And she who's born, who has many children has become feeble. Listen to this, verse 6. The Lord kills and he makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he brings up. Yeah, the Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. Well, pay, pay attention to the words Hannah's using here. He brings low. And he lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust. And he lifts the beggar from the ash heap. To set them amongst the princes. And to make them inherit the throne of glory. Colossians 3. Let me read another scripture before I get into the seven steps you have to take. So the Bible says God is the one that puts one down. And God is the one that brings someone up. So, you know what that tells you? You don't have to brown nose. You don't have to, you know, I'm not saying you, sh you shouldn't be respectful for your boss. You should respect your boss, no matter how they treat you. You should definitely, um, you should definitely uh, honor their position. You know, you have to respect the chain of command and stuff in your business and corporation. But, if you're looking to your boss's hand to help you today... You cut off, you forfeited God's hand of help. Listen to this, Colossians 3, verse 22. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. In today's language, today's lingo, employee, respect your, your boss, respect your employer, and work hard for him. Listen to this, not with eye service as a man pleaser. Not because you're trying to secure his favor, 
I just hope my boss really likes me. You know, if he likes me, maybe I can, I can be next in line for that promotion at work. Not with eye service as man pleasers. The motivation behind working diligently for my boss is not, I don't have a boss. My boss is the Lord because, you know, I, I, we run this ministry and stuff. But if you have an employer, you're working not as an eye, an eye service. You know, when he's looking at you, then you start to, you know, put your posture up and you, you pretend that you're on your work at, on your computer hard at work. But then when he looks away, you start taking out your phone and texting. Not, as, I, well, not with eye service as man pleasers. But in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Fearing God. Why? Because God's eyes are in every place. He keeps, he keeps watch on the good and he keeps watch on the evil. See, people who live, and I've always called it this, a practical atheism. What do I mean by that? They call themselves Christians. They even say they believe in Jesus Christ. They go to church on Sunday. But then, in their relationships with others, and specifically today, I'm talking about your employer, you live as a practical atheist. You talk behind their back. You, you say, okay, I hate my boss. And when, whenever they gather around the water cooler and they start complaining about how, how, how he runs things, you just join in with them. Your, your life no, looks no different in your, your attitude and character than anyone else. And it's a level of practical atheism because... When everyone else is running their mouth about the boss and you join in, it shows that you too don't believe that you're going to have to give an account to God. It shows that you too do not believe that God's eyes are in every place. He hears everything. He sees everything. So why Paul says, you should be living not with eye service or as man pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, genuine heart, fearing God. Because we must, not only are we going to have to give an account to him on judgment day, but in this life, the way we live, our discipline, our walk with the Lord, our, our, our manner of doing things is going to dictate whether you go to a high place in life or you stay blended in with the rest. What's going to designate your ascent on high? What's going to distinguish you? In your generation. It is not because you're a great networker. I wrote this on Twitter the other day. And I feel like it's bare, it, it, it bears repetition. I wrote this on Twitter. And it, I said, uh, don't look for a man to promote you. No matter the level of influence, they're limited. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Do his word. And he'll promote you, establish you in a way that no level of networking or human influence can. There's too many people, they're, they're so geared. If they can just get into the right f circle, if we can just network better, then, you know, we're finally going to get our big break. You know how many evangelists are like that? That if I can just preach at that church, oh, if that guy could just have me on his television show, I I'll have my big break. I, I, I know that God will open up doors because of it. They're not looking to the Lord. They're looking to a man's hand. And no matter their influence, no matter... Their, their level of, uh, of, of, of platform that the Lord's given them. They can't help you the way that God can help you. Listen to this. I believe it's in Psalm 146. I hope I'm right. Yes, it is. Psalm 146, verse 3. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but I feel the spirit on this. Do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there's no help. What's a prince? It's someone who has a high level of influence. Don't put your trust in them. Don't put your trust in a son of man in whom there's no help. Verse four, listen to this. Once his spirit departs, once he dies, he returns to the earth. He's buried. In that very day, his plans to help you perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So the Bible says it very clearly. The moment... You know, you're trying to get that evangelist specifically, that pastor I have you in. If that guy dies and then the next pastor ends up uh, coming in and he hates your preaching, in that day, his plans to help you perish. But God never dies. God will never die. God's never going to become weaker. God's never going to become less influential. God's hand is never going to be le uh, less strong than it is now. He's... Forever, eternally strong. The Bible says he neither wearies nor does he faint. 
Some put their trust in horses. Some put their trust in princes. But they've, they've misplaced their trust. Because those things, the Bible says, the help of man is useless in comparison to how God can help. But we will put our trust in the Lord. The God of Jacob is our help. Let me go through the qualifications for divine promotion. Number one, qualification for divine promotion. Number one step to take if you're going to walk in divine promotion is you need to live in holiness. You cannot use prayer as a way to circumvent holiness to get to the prize that God has for you. Prayer is not a substitute for holiness. You're living in sin, but you know, I, I pray every day that God helps me. The Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, if I had regarded iniquity in my heart, the Lord would never hear me. Psalm 66, 18, I heard a preacher say this the other day, and I, I couldn't disagree more. He said, we know that God hears everyone's prayers. Absolutely not. He does not hear everyone's prayers. What a, a lie to pitch to our generation. God only hears. The Bible says his, his ears are closed to the wicked, but his ears are open to the cries of the righteous. The only prayer God will hear from someone who has lived in sin his entire life is the prayer to save him. But any other prayer he doesn't hear. Any other prayer is gone ignored in heaven. Doesn't even reach the ears of God. Because he said, if you regard, if you regard, what does it mean to regard? If you entertain sin in your heart, if you focus on sin in your heart, if you're dabbling in sin, if you're not willfully and intentionally turning from sin and living a life on the path of righteousness and the highway of holiness, God will not hear your prayers for help. That's not my opinion. That is scripture. And I can prove it. Turn to Joshua 7. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua, the seventh chapter, and beginning with verse 1. If you're just tuning in now, you'd be a great service to me if you helped me uh, by sharing this broadcast. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burnt against the children of Israel. So the Bible says God gave him an instruction. Don't touch the gold of the land that I just gave you to conquer. Don't touch their gold and their silver. Don't touch their cattle. Don't touch any. Burn it all up. But they, Achan, took some of the gold and hid it in his tent. And the Bible says, and God, God said, but my grace is sufficient for them. Amen. No, the anger of the Lord was burnt against the children of Israel. I heard, of, I, I saw a preacher tweet this last week and I'd retweeted it because it's true. Because there's this lie in this generation that says, you know, you can't out sin God's grace. Amen. Yes, you can out sin God's grace. That's why hell exists. It's for people who quit, who, who never quit sinning and then die. And now they've out sinned God's grace. As long as there's breath in your lungs, you can ask God to forgive you and his grace will forgive you if you turn from sin. Remember, God does not forgive all sin. God forgives and cleanses people of repented sin, sin that they have repented of, that they've turned the other way from, that they're now turned towards God and striving to live a holy life. God doesn't forgive all sin. He, he forgives the sin that people have turned from, that have repented from, that they've eliminated from their life. So you can out -sin God's grace. People do it all the time. That's why hell exists. This whole thing that, you know, no matter how far you've gone, God's grace covers everything. If you have, if you've turned around, if the prodigal son had kept sinning, his father, he would have been there with arms wide open. The grace is available. But you know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He said, God's grace towards me was not in vain. Meaning that God's grace is available and accessible for all. But many, it goes in vain. Because they've, and they've been wrongfully told that because grace is there, it doesn't matter how I live, God's grace is there. He loves me and uh, I, I'm going to make heaven I'm going to live my best life now because God's grace is there and his favor is there. 
Doesn't matter how I live. Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter where I go. If that's the case, why does Psalm 1 say, how blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the path of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the Lord, Lord and in his word he does meditate day and night. He'll be like a tree. Why doesn't it just say, how blessed is the man that, regardless of if he walks in the counsel of the wicked, regardless of where he goes and what he sits, where he sits and who he talks to and what he does, regardless of all those things, he, he's like a tree firmly planted because God's grace is available for him. No, it says, but he that's, whose meditation is on the Lord. If, if sin was such a light thing in the eyes of God, why is it that throughout the entirety of scriptures, beginning with Cain, where he said, Sin is creeping at your door and its desire is like a lion to pounce on you and overcome you and overwhelm you and kill you and you have to take dominion over it and if you if you do do that if you if you reject it if you overcome temptation then the bible says will not your your countenance be lifted will not your countenance be lifted will you not be blessed But its desire is for you, but you have to overcome it. Why did God warn Cain? This was before he killed Abel. He actually came and said, in grace. You know, grace oftentimes is expressed in God's warning, don't do that. People think grace is just an after thing, an afterthought. Once you've done it, you can go and get God's grace. Actually, the strongest grace God has available to people is the warning he gives you to not do that thing. He's trying to prevent you from the horrors that that thing is going to bring and produce for you. He's trying to keep you from the sorrow that sin brings on a person. Remember, obedience is a magnet for blessing. Disobedience and sin is a magnet for sorrow and, 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 and distress of heart. Let me, let me continue reading just because I'm getting off track and we have a lot to, carry, to, to cover today. The anger of the Lord was burnt against the children of Israel. So now Joshua sent men from from Jericho. He had no clue yet. Joshua had no clue that that Achan had done that. And he had no clue that God was angry against him. Joshua sends men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Beth Avon on the east side of Bethel. And spoke to them saying, go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, "Hey, hey, don't let everyone go up. Let about 200, 300, uh, two, 3,000 men go up and attack AI. We don't have to worry everybody out. There's such a few people in AI. There's such an easy... I mean, we just defeated so many of the Canaanites. These guys are... are, are this will be cheap labor for us. We don't have to send anybody, everybody out. Give some of them a rest. They can, they can sit this one out. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of AI. And the men of AI struck down about 36 men. For they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So understand this. If you're living in sin, even the easy battles of life become hard and laborsome. When you're living in righteousness and pleasing God and walking in holiness, even the things that other people deem as impossible become easy and weary free easy stress free effortless effortless battles to engage with and win when you're living in sin let me repeat that when you're living in sin even the easy battles of life even the things other people have no problem with become problematic for you when you're living in righteousness and striving to live in holiness and please the lord you're having dominion over sin Even the hard, impossible battles of life become easy for you because the hand of God comes behind you and thrusts you forward. And no matter the adversary or opposition around you, because God is for you, there's nothing that can come against you and wipe you out. Your your promotion is guaranteed because the hand of God is behind you, pushing you forward. So what happened here. They took AI as some like easy thing. Oh, let's not even bother sending our full army. But because sin was in the camp, they got defeated and they fled before the men of Ai. And the hearts of the people melted like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and he fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. And he and the elders of Israel put dust on their, he- their, their heads. They were trying to make sense of it. 
And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this, pe- this, um, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? Is it to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we've been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and they'll cut off your name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So Joshua was saying, Lord, you said that we were going to have victory. You know, you read Joshua chapter one, it says nobody's going to be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Well, I gave that, pe- that word to the people and here we are around, uh, engaged in battle with this tiny army And they stood before us and they wiped us out. And now the people are disheartened. They don't even want to fight anyone because they feel like you've abandoned us. What, why have you abandoned us? Joshua is pretty pretty much saying, why have you forsaken us? And you know what the Lord said? The Lord said to Joshua in verse 10, get up. Why are you lying on your face? Get up. There's, I said it before. There's no amount of prayer that can circumvent holiness. You can't pray past God's Basic instructions to live a holy life. It, prayer is not a substitute for living a holy life. It's not. There's prayer. There's holiness. But if you don't want to live holy, you can just pray past all that, all those demands, all the mumbo jumbo on, in the scripture, all that, all that talk about living a, a holy life. You know, that's just for the few that don't want to pray. But if you'll pray, you can go past that. No, it's not a. There's not a, a higher privilege for the few that pray. Paul, uh, God said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face? No matter, you can pray until you're blue in the face. You can fast and pray the next 80 days and die from fasting and prayer. It ain't gonna change your situation. Israel has sinned, he said, and they've transgressed my covenant for they have taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived and they have put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel couldn't stand before their enemies. But they turned their back before their enemies because they've become doomed to destruction. Doomed to destruction. This is God. This is not me. I'm not adding this. This is directly from the New King James Bible. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. God said, I'm leaving you unless you destroy the accursed thing. That is, from a, that, is in, that is among you. That is a message that nobody, not, not nobody, that's not true. There's a lot of preachers I know that preach that. But very few people, very few preachers preach that, that God will actually leave a person. Because they say, well, no, the Bible says I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to those that are living in light of his word. Zechariah 7.13 says, because you've called and I, you, because I have called and you didn't listen to me, so you will call and I won't listen to you. The Bible says in, in um, I forget what book in the Old Testament, but the, I think it's 1, 1 Chronicles 15. He says, um, because you have forsaken me, God said, so will I forsake you. So there is a point where God actually leaves a person. Now, that's not to say he's not there, arms wide open, ready to receive them back. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, I will not be with you anymore unless you you destroy the accursed thing from among you. And the Bible says they were doomed to destruction. Sin dooms a man to destruction. Sin is a shipwrecker of man's destiny. No matter how hard you try, some people, they live in sin in one nation. They just think, if I can just move to that city, then I'll be blessed. Sin will follow you in every city of the world. It'll follow you to the highest mountain. It'll follow you to the lowest, to the lowest valley. It doesn't matter where you're geographically located. The sorrow and the curse of sin is going to follow you if you haven't put an end of the accursed thing, which represents sin in your life. It doesn't matter where you try and hide from. Be sure, the Bible says, your sin will find you out. It'll locate you. People are trying to, you know, if I can just move there, then all these problems will go away. No, the problems will follow you there. It'll hunt you down there. Sin is like an acid. It'll eat away at your life. And anything you attempt to build, Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Anything you try to build outside of God is vain, useless labor. 
And it, it's just going to be destroyed. It's not going to, even if you get something off the ground, it's only for a little while. God actually said, you see the wicked? They love to spread themselves like a green tree and they love to put their roots deep down. But don't worry, it's only so that they get destroyed forever. That's what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. It says, don't fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. Because they'll be, they'll be soon done away with. Indeed, you'll look for their place and you'll not find it anymore. But blessed is the man who is instructed from the word of God. He'll be blessed in t- good times and he'll be blessed in bad times. Isaac was in a famine and he sowed. But because he lived in light of God's word, in the midst of a famine, he reaped a hundredfold blessing. Holiness is the number one qualifier for divine promotion. Number two, obedience. Now you might be confused. Isn't that the same thing as holiness? No. Holiness is, you know, living apart from sin. There's a lot of people that live holy, but they're not obedient to specific instructions that God has given them pertaining to their life and destiny. It's not enough. If you want divine promotion, it's not enough. Just, well, I don't commit adultery. I don't burst out in anger. I don't you know, I don't, uh, I'm not a thief. I don't steal and all that. That's great. That's what you should be doing. Uh, If you do all those things, the Bible says that um, anyone that practices these things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So great. You don't practice those things. You'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. But if you want to see heaven on earth, you got to follow God's plan and specific instructions for your life. If God called me to the ministry to be an evangelist and I try to plant a church somewhere as a pastor, I'm not going to have promotion. Follow me in those areas. I'm not going to have goodness and blessing and honor chase me down in those areas. I'm not going to have the growth that I want to see. If I just decide to go out and do whatever I want to do because, you know, I'm saved and I'm in the ministry. God called me. No, what specifically did God call me to do in the ministry? And that is he called me to be an evangelist. And I've had opportunity to 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 join staffs of churches and all that. And I, I have a clear instruction from the Lord. I'm an evangelist to do crusades and win the lost and, and, and steer people up by my internet ministry to, to also have a love for evangelism and a zeal for evangelistic endeavors. I know that. I have specific instructions. Some people, they get saved and then they just live life however they see fit to live life. They're totally unaware that God has a specific path and a plan for them to follow. And as a result, you know, people, I've heard people preach Romans 12. The Bible says that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and that we'll, we will uh, show this world what is the good, permissive, and perf- perfect will of God. And I've heard people say that God has a good will, God has a permitted will, and God has a perfect will. And, you know, whatever will you're in, it's, uh, you know, as long as you're in either his good, permissive, or perfect will, you'll be okay. no. That's not true. God's will is all, it's good. It's not, there's three separate wills he has. Those three things describe his will. It's a good will. It is his permissive will. It is a permitted will. It's what, it's the only thing he's permitted you to do. And it's his, it's a perfect will. It is good. It's permitted and it's perfect. That's a definition of his one will that he has for you. There's not three wills that you just choose which path you're going to go on. Well, he's actually called me, you know, to, I feel called specifically to, um, to, to open up a business here in this city, but I think he'll permit me if I go to that city and do a t- completely different, you know, work for this guy or go into a completely different career or whatever. That, it doesn't work that way. It is his, all three, his good, permissive, and perfect will. Abraham was promoted not because he did things his way. Abraham was promoted because his faith was demonstrated through his action in that he was obeying God at every point of the way. Every point of obedience. You can study Genesis and take note of everything God told Abraham to do. At every point of Abraham's obedience to the specific will of God, that was appointed for him to do, he unleashed divine promotion immediately. Genesis 12, depart from your family, your relatives, go into the land and I'll show you and I'll bless you there. And Abraham, the next morning, packed up his bags and he left with Sarah and Lot. And the Bible says, Genesis 13, one chapter later, and Abraham was very rich rich in livestock, silver, and gold. 
Then you look in Genesis chapter, uh, I think it's Genesis chapter 17 or 15 rather, that Abraham goes to war against the kings to bail out the king of Sodom and Lot and all that. And the Bible says very clearly that when Melchizedek came, he was obedient to tithe everything. He gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. And then he said, I'm not going to take one sandal string of all the spoil of war, lest the king of Sodom should say, I have made Abraham rich. So he said, I'm looking to God alone as my source. And I'm not going to deviate from the path God has for me. What did that trigger off? The next chapter starts off. And God appeared to Abram by night and said, Abraham, if, as you walk before me and you're blameless, I am your exceedingly great reward. And I will bless you. Genesis 22, God says, take Isaac, your only son, offer him up on the, off, on, the, on, the, on the mountain, which I will show you. Abraham, the next morning, rising up early, takes a couple of lads with him and with some sticks and cord, and he brings him up to the mountain, and he ties him up, and as he's about to obey God and take his own son's life, the Lord, an angel of the Lord, stayed his hand and said, Abraham, don't touch the child, for now I know that you fear God and you not withhold anything from him. And in blessing, because you have this done, the Bible says, Genesis 22, in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply you. Every point of obedience in Abraham's life triggered off an unprecedented level of promotion, reward, and increase. Acts 27, Paul tells the owner of the ship and the centurion, by the spirit, he says, we should not set forth on this journey. We shouldn't set sail. We should stay back for a little while. And then I'll give you the okay, because the Lord will release us. They disobeyed that instruction. They said, no, no, no. They took heed to the experts of sailing. The Bible says they gave heed to the helmsman and the captain of the ship over the things that Paul had spoken. And what was the result? Immediately shipwrecked. 14, 15, 21 days, they were shipwrecked. They ended up, they ended up uh, uh, going through a, an unnecessarily hard time. They didn't have to go through that. Had they listened to Paul, they would have avoided all of that, but instead they refused to heed Paul's instruction and it led them directly to disaster. Obedience leads to plenty. Obedience leads to peace. The Bible says the uprightness or the righteousness of the blameless man, the one who's done everything he knows to do that God's told him to do, the righteousness of the blameless man will direct his way upright or will secure his way. Righteousness brings security. But disobedience leads to shame, poverty, and disaster. Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, you will spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. If you're willing and obedient, you will taste of the good of the land. Job 36, 11, if you obey and serve God, you'll spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. For promotion to come, the magnet of obedience has to be in place. Listen to this. If you're in a place right now, all this boils down to what I'm about to say. You're in a place right now where you're stagnant. You're in a place where you're idle, where you feel like you've just been stuck and you've prayed and you've fasted and you've, you, you, you've, you've, you've received counsel from other men of God and all that and you feel like you're not moving forward. Go back, think, take a day to meditate. Has the Lord spoken to me anything? That's what David did, Psalm 139. Lord, if there be anything harmful in me, anything I haven't done, or anything I have done that's displeased you, point it out to me and lead me in the everlasting way. If you feel stagnant right now, ask the Lord, and he'll do it if you're sincere. He'll show you. He's, get this out of your mind, that the Lord is trying to hold back promotion from you. That God is some sadistic God. That he just loves seeing you struggle. No. He loves to see his children blessed. He delights in the prosperity of his children. And so, he wants to show you what loose connection you have so you can tighten it. So the flow of his blessing can come. So ask the Lord. Lord, show me if there's any specific instruction that I have not heeded. That I've delayed. You know, delayed obedience is disobedience. Putting something off that God's clearly told you, told you to do is going to set 
is, is going gonna, is gonna to delay your breakthrough. Delayed obedience, delayed breakthrough. God can't take you to the next level until you fulfill and have heeded to his basic instructions for your life. Jonah ran from God. Look where it led him. The moment he turned back, the whale spat him out, and he was back, back on the course. If you'll follow God's leading today, and remember, Isaiah 48, 17 says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit and leads you in the way you should go. So God's leading is never going to bring you backwards. God's leading is never going to bring you sideways and horizontally and just constantly going out in circles and circles, constantly going around in this vicious cycle of frustration. God's leading is always forward. Joshua, if you will indeed obey my commandments and do everything I've observed, I've told you to do, indeed you will prosper and you will have good success. Only be strong and very courageous and I'll never, be, I'll never forsake you. Joshua was told, if you'll heed to my instruction, you will prosper and you'll have good success. As long as Josiah sought the Lord, there's a, there's a problem in the church today. People just live wherever they want to live, do whatever they want to do, and uh, expect God to bless them. Why do you go to that church? Well, you know, our family goes there. Why, why do you live in that city with, and do that job? Uh, you know, I just thought it. Just thought it'd be a good idea. It, it brings in money. You know, it does the, pays the bills, amen? Instead of talking, you, you sound no different from people that don't know God. You sound no different from the rest of the world. You sound no different from people who, who don't even have the access you have by, via redemption to this blessing. Just going, just, you're carried about by the wind. Everywhere. The wind, you're not in command of your life. Life commands you. And that's a very dangerous place to be. You should live in a place because the Lord told you to live there. You should go to the church that the Lord told you to go to. You should have a job and a career and whatever God's calling is for your life based on what he's called you to do, not based on what you thought was a good thing to do. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit. The reason why? People don't profit and people don't have this, this, this wind behind their back. See, there's some people, and I know, every, it's like, it's effortless. They're constantly leveling up in life. And then people look at them and they scratch their head and they said, well, why does God bless them and not me? Maybe, just maybe, because they're not just doing things how, how things come. They're not just floating in life like a, 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 a bubble in the air, just wherever the wind takes it. Maybe. They're actually living intentionally. Maybe, just maybe, they actually take God's instructions seriously and actually fast. And, why do you think we fast and pray at the beginning of the year? It's not so that God can bless my plans. It's so that I can get His plan. And when I do His plan, it's already blessed. You don't have to plan your way. There's a way that seems right unto men. Its end is the way of death. God can't bless your plan. God blesses His plans, and it's up to you to line your life up with His plan. And when you do it, the Bible says, what eye has not seen, what ear has never heard, what has never entered the heart, will come to those that follow His plan and walk according to His purpose and His counsel, to those that love Him and walk according to His counsel. Jeremiah 6.16, God said, Ask of me the old ways, wherein the good way is. Ask of me of what I... You know, he's the one that designed you. He manufactured you. He wired you. Surely, you know, Steve Jobs, when he designed the, the Apple iPhone, he knew exactly what is in it. He knew how to navigate. He knew the secrets of the iPhone. He knew everything. He designed the thing. Well, God designed you. He wired you. And he didn't wire you for you to go out and ask for everyone else's advice who are products just like you are. Instead, why don't you ask the manufacturer what he sees fit you should do, how he's wired you, and what specific calling he has for you, and see how, how great life becomes. Life doesn't have to be a drudgery. Life can be, life can be enjoyable. Number three, let me r run through these. Quit looking to the hands of men. I talked about this briefly before. Jeremiah 17, cursed is the man who puts his trust in man and makes man his hope and his strength. Cursed is the man who puts his trust in man. 
Bible says, if you're looking to everyone else but God, you'll, you'll incur a curse on your life. God hates to be doubted. And the greatest expression of doubt is to constantly trying to secure man's help and man's advice and man's intervention. Can you use one eye to look up and one eye to look down? You should try it. Can you use your eyes? Put, put, try and put one your right eye up and your left eye down. Can you do it? No. Neither can you look to God and look to man at the same time. And don't claim to be looking to God and looking to man at the same time. When you look to man, you got to trust him to help you. You got to trust him for promotion. And it's, man is unstable, the Bible says, and stable as waters. And I said, I read it before out of Psalm 146, the day he dies, his plans to help you perish. And he's limited in resources, limited in influence, limited in his platform. You know, I could only put my son, I, I could only lift him up as high as my arms can lift him. In the same vein, man can only lift you up as high as he has the ability to lift you. But God's arms are limitless. And he can put you in a place that, like I just said before, no eye has seen. I can only lift my child up to the level that I can reach. God's reach is far better than any man's reach. Have him lift you up. Trust. That's why I read Colossians 3 before. Because people are... They, they, they're living to please their boss and only when their boss is looking. The moment he looks away, they do whatever they want. They're, they don't genuinely believe God is scrutinizing us right now. He is, he is, he's, he's looking on our thoughts, our motives, our actions. That's why the Bible says we are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Quit looking to the hands of men. In the Old Testament, every king that sought the help of another king and another army to help them bail them out of something, God forsook them and left them on their own. And they were called wicked kings. Why do you think they erected altars up to other gods? Because they had made allegiances with other nations that served other gods. And so a lot of times part of the deal was that they had to have altars erected to the gods of those nations. And the moment they did that, that's what you're doing. When you start to place your trust in another person outside of God or even a system that God hasn't implemented in your life, you're, even if you're not aware of it, you're erecting an altar to an unknown God and you're forfeiting God's help as a result. Psalm 121, I will look to my help. I will look to my mountain. I'll look to the obstacle. I'll look to what's preventing me from increase. And I will, I will do what? I will look a little higher. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord. David said, my help comes from the Lord. David said in Psalm 34, I looked to him and my face became radiant and I was no longer ashamed. Stop looking to men. Stop looking to your past. Stop looking to government, to a political system, to the left, to the right to the conservatives or the liberals, to the Democrats or the Republicans. Look to the Lord. Humble yourself under his mighty hand. And the Bible says he'll lift you up. And the good news is, is once God begins your lifting, there is no devil, there's no witch, there's no witchcraft, there's no government, there's no man. Satan himself cannot close a door that God opens. The Bible says God, Jesus, holds the key of David. He opens and no man can close. He, he lifts up the gate that no man can close. And he said, see, I've set before thee an open door that no man will be able to close. Number four, don't, this is important, don't talk, down talk your future. Don't down talk your future. Oh, I'm not much. You know, I, I've never, never been much in life. I don't know how I'll ever get there. Well, I hear oh, God wants to bless people and all that, but I don't know if I'll ever get there. I've never been the wisest. I've never been the sharpest tool in the shed. People, Christians, I'm sad to say, shoot for the worst. They got zero expectation as to what God, God wants to do for them. They read the stories of the Bible as a fairy tale encouraging book just to see what God's done for others but they have zero trust that God actually wants to do it for them they read the Bible like it's a museum you know you go to a museum you look at a mummy's tomb or whatever you're like wow it's amazing how great they preserve that isn't that great 
but it doesn't do anything for you to change your future. It doesn't act as a as a uh, as guidance for your future. In this, that's how people read the word. They read what David, how God promoted David as he was a man after his own heart. They read about Joseph's life, how he re- he refused to sin against the Lord, and even though. Time and time again, he faced obstacles. At the end of his life, he became, not the end of his life, by 30 years old, he was prime minister of Egypt. And the Bible says nobody, not even a dog barked its mouth, unless unless Joseph had ordained it. He had total command over all of Egypt. And they read Joseph's story and they say, wow. But it doesn't, it doesn't serve as a, as a guiding point for what God wants to do for them in their future. They just take it as a relic from the past. Let me tell you, David said it this way. All of thy testimonies in this book I have taken as my heritage forever. David said, the the testimonies of scripture, I take it as my inheritance for what's awaiting me as I follow you in the same way they followed you. What God has done for others and documented in scripture is not something that we're to reminisce on. It's a blueprint for where the Lord wants to take us. And Joseph was not free from trial and challenges and problems, but as he never, you know, one of the secrets to Joseph's success was he never took his eyes off the prize. When God showed him that dream at the at, at, at the beginning of his life, when he was like 17 years old, he didn't just keep it to himself, you know, we'll see if it comes to pass, then it was God, if not, then I'm, I'm definitely not going to voice this. No, he began to speak about his future. There's too many people that do the opposite of what Joseph did. They down talk about their future. I don't know if I'll ever have that. I don't know if we'll ever get there. I'm not much to look at. Instead of doing that, why don't you do like like Joseph did, where he he started to, to not brag. He wasn't arrogantly bragging about it. But he was not ashamed of the dream God placed in his heart. He was such a dreamer that his own brothers came and said, here's this dreamer. Here comes this dreamer. And you know what? The thing is, is that when you start to dream big, and instead of confessing every weakness that you have that's excusing you from attaining a high place in life, instead you start to confess a future that matches the strength and power of, the, the, of, of God. There's too many people, they're confessing a future that depends on them. Instead, confess a future that matches the strength and power of God. I don't talk about my future based on what I'm able to accomplish. Jesus said, I could do nothing of myself. What I do is what the Father has given me power to accomplish. Well, in the same vein, you should say, by myself, I'm like a reed shaken. By myself, there ain't nothing much that dwells good in me. But by the anointing, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Start to confess a future that matches the strength and power of your God. When you start to think of how big God is, do you do you envision a, a small nothing future for yourself? Or when you start to dwell on his greatness, how great he is, how big he is, how he said I'm able to do a far more abundantly what you can ask, think, or imagine. What thoughts come to your mind? Religion brainwashes people to think small. Religion is like a, a, a mental cap, mental captivity. And it keeps people in a small thinking. What did God tell Abraham? Abraham, you're in a tent right now. Come out of your tent. Look up. See the scars? Stars in the sky? Uh, count them. Can you count them? No. That's how many descendants I'm going to give you. There's too many people. They're in the tent of religion. When they look up, they see a ceiling. God said, come out of the tent. Come out where there's a ceiling. Come out from where there's a ceiling and come into a place where you see limitless potential. Don't talk down about your future. If you're a child of God, then use your faith to believe God for high things and then believe that God will work miracles to bring you there. If you're a child of God, you should should put a, I think it was Oral Roberts that had a sign on his desk. No small planning here. You're belittling your future. When you plan small, plan big, expect big, ask big, and believe big. And God's too faithful to to, to do it. The Bible says very clearly that God is a rewarder 
of them that diligently seek him. Faith brings a good report. And as your faith is, so be it unto you, Jesus said. You have faith for small things? So be it unto you. You want to plan for the bare minimum? You know, there's a lot of people in life, they have a pessimistic approach to life, and everything they do is layered and drowned in pessimism. There was a guy, this is a great story. I'm glad the Lord popped, just steered it in my spirit. There was a guy that was, um, he was a fisher, and he'd go to a, this is a true story. He'd go to a, a, a place near the river where he'd fish every day. And one day, a man, I forget his name, but he started to observe this guy. Every morning, he'd see him there at the same time, 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m. He'd see him fishing. And every time the guy would bring out a big fish, you know, like a 20-inch or two-footer, he'd throw it back in. He'd throw it back in the waters. He wouldn't take it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, put it in his, his uh, freezer next to him. But any time he brought in a fish that was about 10 inches long, under 10 inches, he would take it and put it in the freezer. So one day he got the boldness to go and ask him. He said, sir, why is it that every fish that's bigger than 10 inches, you put it back in the, you throw it back in, uh, into the river. And all the fish that are less than 10 inches, you keep. Wouldn't you want to do the opposite? And you know what the man said? My frying pan's only 10 inches long, so I can't fit those ones in. And that gives you a lesson. Your expectation is like that man's frying pan. If you expect 10 inch blessing, you'll only get 10 inch blessing. But if you start to take the limits off as to what God can do and start to expect, expect in measure to God's abilities, not in measure to your ability, then you can take in the bigger fish of God's blessings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God operates by the laws of faith. You can't, he can't take you to a place that you're speaking against. He can't lift you to a place that you've, you've never spoken about. The Bible says you call those things which be not that as though they are. So what if you're not seeing it? So what if it's impossible? If you, if, if you, could, if you could accomplish it, what, what need would you have of God to get there? Don't start to confess things that are possible. Confess the things that, like Joseph, makes your brothers laugh at you. David, I'm going to kill Goliath. His brothers, what did they do? Hey, go back to the few sheep that our father put you in charge of. They, they tried to squash him down. They, they didn't believe him. David just ignored the naysayers and he went on and killed Goliath. Number four, don't town talk your future. Number five, quit complaining about where you are now. That's a, this follows through. Numbers 21, they complained about where they were in the wilderness. And the Bible says that God sent fiery serpents to, to bite them, and many died. 1 Corinthians 15, don't complain, as some of them complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Complaining releases swift and imminent destruction. Ingratitude is the root, the root cause of complaining. Ingratitude is the root cause of complaining, and complaining, when you complain, they complain against God and against their leadership. And complaining is just excuse in disguise. You're excusing as to why. You're, you're bringing up excuses as to why you're not where you want to be. And you're blaming everybody else about it instead of taking a toll on your own life. Ingratitude leads to complaining and complaining triggers disaster. Every time you complain, you're backsetting your promotion. Every time you complain and you're ungrateful. About where you are. You know, the Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. For he that began the good work in you, he's going to complete it. So don't despise where you're at now. When I started out in the ministry, I could have easily have complained. And I had temptation to complain. No pastor wanted to have me in. I don't have a family of ministry. I had nobody endorsing our ministry. I had nothing. Could have complained. These, these pastors, they're just afraid of revival. You know, that's how some people, they, they say it. Evangelists that don't have people, they don't have uh, meetings or any open doors in their ministry. And they say, these, fans, these pastors are just afraid of revival. They're blaming the pastors for it, when in reality, it has nothing to do with the pastor. Be faithful in the little. And part of being faithful in the little is not complaining about the little God gives you. Be happy you have the little. Be happy that you're even at the level you're at. Until you thank God... For the menu you have set before you right now, you're not qualified for a change of menu. 
So every time you complain, you're backsetting your promotion. On the flip side, every time you give thanks, you're advancing your promotion day. Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Let me read it. Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. I hope I can find Habakkuk. He's always, he's always, hi- oh, there you go. He's always hiding somewhere in, in the middle. Habakkuk 7, uh, 3, 17 to 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, Though there be no fruit on the vine, though the labor of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of salvation. And the Lord God is my strength. He'll make my feet like deer's feet, and he'll make me to to walk on the high places. Habakkuk was saying, even though I don't see anything manifesting right now, I'm going to keep being faithful at what God's called me to do. See, people are complaining because they're not where they want to be, and in their time that they're consuming and talking about where they want to be and how they're not there yet, and all that time wasted, they could have used that time to actually be faithful at the level they're at right now and then accelerate their promotion. My good friend, Pastor Oscar Sosa, called in to the ministry, went to Bible college, left everything, good job, good everything, with his wife, left a teaching job, they go to Bible college in Florida, they come back here, and... uh, you know, there, at the church, he was expecting that he was going to get hired right away and stuff. And he could have easily have complained about it. Well, why, why isn't pastor this hiring me? Ah, man, I just went to Bible college. You know, pretty sure he even promised me a position the moment I got back. And, you know, I have a family to feed. I got it. He could have complained. He could have talked about how, how, um, how, 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 how the church... You know, I don't know what, they know I'm called to ministry and they still aren't giving me a position on staff. Could have done all that. He never, I never heard a word come out of his mouth like that. Instead, he would, he would, he, he worked like, he went back to working a job at the bank and he would every, all, all of his excess time, any other time that he wasn't working at the bank, he was found at church and doing whatever he could do. He, he made available his hands and did whatever he could do at the church. Salary, no salary. There was no salary. There was no payment. He just made himself available. And on the days he had off, he was at the church at 9 a.m., ready there for pastor to give him whatever instructions, he, whatever thing he needed done that day, and he did it. And there was nothing pastoral about the duties and activities he was doing on those given days. He just did. He was faithful. He didn't complain about where he wasn't. He was faithful and thankful that at least... He could do what, uh, you know, at the level he was at right now, he could do whatever he could do. And I'm telling you, our, our church had no plans on hiring for a little while. He, he, ex- he like, he forced the hand of God to promote him in that area. And my pastor hired him and he's on staff. And it's a great example of not despising the day of small beginnings. S- and I'll say, with comp- not complaining about where you are, quit complaining about other people getting celebrated and other people getting promoted. That's one of the gravest dangers, dangers of someone who, who's not seeing the promotion that, that they've been believing for is they start to complain about other people receiving the promotion that they want. They complain. Instead of celebrating others, they complain about, well, why does he get it? It's like the prodigal son's brother. I've been here this whole time. You never gave me a feast like that. Instead, celebrate where God is taking others, and one day you'll have your own to celebrate about. Number six, God will not take you to the level, God will not take you beyond the level of criticism that you're able to handle. This is important. God can't take you to the level, to a a high level, where you're not able to handle the criticism at that level. Anybody that does anything in life is going to be criticized. I forget if it was Albert Einstein or Ben Franklin, someone, I forget the quote, but someone said that um, if you desire to never be criticized, then do nothing in life. Do nothing in life. Just sit down and be quiet, live your nine to five job, do nothing in life, and you'll never be criticized. You'll, you'll blend in with the rest. And that's exactly what the devil wants to, to have you. Uh, that's exactly what the devil wants for you. The moment you start to take a step forward, David went to kill Goliath. His family, his brothers said, started to criticize him, started to speculate about his motives. And people are going to speculate about your motives. Now, you're just arrogant. That's what they said of David. You're just prideful. 
You're just a larger than life individual. It's pride that's causing you to take these steps for increase. It's not pride. It's about me understanding that God didn't put me on this earth to just blend in. God didn't just put me on this earth to sit quiet and decay. God didn't put me on this earth to just coast through life. He put me on this earth to occupy and take dominion in whatever area and field he's placed me in. David understood that. It wasn't pride. David was a man after God's own heart. It wasn't pride that he was going after Goliath. And this is a thing. When you start to desire to go into places that people around you have never gone to, their guilt that they feel because they haven't taken the steps and they haven't followed the instructions that were necessary to get that promotion, the guilt that they feel is going to manifest in them backbiting against you and gossiping against you and speaking ill about you. They're going to try and pull you down. It's like a a crab's bucket. You have 15, 20 different crabs in a bucket. One finally starts to get out of the bucket, wants to, wants to, wants to, to live beyond the bucket of religion and tradition. And then all of a sudden, another crab leg comes up and just grabs the crab's leg and brings it right back into the, into the mold. Joseph starts to share his dreams. His, own, his brothers sell him into slavery. Put him into a ditch first and then realize, hey, you know what? We can make money off him. Let's sell him into slavery. If you think that having dreams in life and God giving dreams in life is going to mean that everyone's going to come behind you and help you and, and bless you and they're going to sow into your work and all, it's not true. Jealousy is an ugly thing. And because people are jealous that you're wanting and being obedient and taking the steps and actually moving towards where they've always dreamed about. You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, there is the soul that desires. The lazy soul desires, but has nothing. It's the soul of the diligent that is made rich. So there's a lot of people that desire what you want and what you're being diligent to obtain, but because they've been lazy and they've not followed through, the Bible says they desire, but they have nothing. And because they have nothing and they see you doing what they were unable to do to acquire the thing they want to have, they try and bring you down. Acts 20, 24, Paul said this, and this is what I want to get into you today. None of these things moved me that I might finish my course with joy to solemnly testify of the gospel of the grace of God. You cannot have anything move you. Don't let their criticism move you. They can't help you, so their criticism, criticism shouldn't move you. See, that's another problem with looking to man, is you look to a man, but then you start to do things that, they, that God's told you to do that they're not, maybe not fond about, and then they start to criticize you and speak bad about you, and now you're, your whole heart, you're disheartened. Like the Israelites, your heart is melted, like, like ice to water. Don't let, any, don't let people's compliments move you and don't let people's criticism move you. And don't take, if people do criticize against you, don't take action to retaliate. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I'll repay. The moment you take action to re retaliate, you brought the vengeance on them and God said, well, you did the vengeance. You did everything you wanted to do. Now, they're not going to... I don't have to act and take my vengeance. The moment you retaliate, the Lord backs off. But if you won't retaliate and do like Paul said, I'm keeping my eyes on the prize. My eyes are fixed on him, the author and perfecter of my faith, of my faith. Then God will deal with your enemies. God will deal with your critics. God will deal with the doubters. He's done it all throughout history. And he won't stop with you. Number seven, and this is, this is important. Hard work and excellent work is required. A required step for a promotion. Don't, don't tune out now. This is important. Proverbs 22, 29. Hard work. And not just hard work. Because you can work hard at the wrong thing. And you can work hard in a, in a wrong manner. And it not bring you anywhere. I'm talking about hard, excellent work. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man... Who excels in his work. He will stand before kings. He'll not stand before unknown men. 
hard work. Daniel 6, 3 says, this Daniel distinguished himself because an excellent spirit was found in him. Are you checking in late at work all the time? And then you're believing God to promote you, but you can't even get there on time? You're not going to get promoted. Do you dress? You know, man looketh at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. But man looks at the outward appearance. Do you look sloppy in, what you, in how you dress at work? I was listening to someone before, and he talked about a contractor uh, that was uh, going to give a quote at a house for a kitchen that he was going to redo. He pulled up in a nice, I don't know if it was a suit, or I think it was a suit. He pulled up in a suit, a contractor. Pulled up in a suit. He had a nice car, and he showed up to give a quote. If that person had two or three other people coming in for a quote and those contractors came in with like raggy clothes and looking like, like a homeless guy off a street, who do you think that person's going to go with? The one who, who expressed excellence in how he, how he walked, how he dressed, his appearance. Your appearance means something. And I know that Something not many people heard because all they hear is God looks at the heart. God, yes, God looks at the heart, but man looks at the appearance. And you have to understand that. And your ex, I'm telling you, I can look at somebody and see how excellent they are based on how they dress. I'm not saying that, you know, if you're a preacher and you don't wear a suit, you're not an excellent preacher. No, there's times I preach, I don't wear a suit. It has nothing to do with that. But even if I'm not wearing a suit, I'm still excellently dressed. No, no matter how I am. When, and, and, and even when I wear a suit, like I, I, tailor, I tailor my suit. I make it look good. There's people that can wear the same suit and one looks good and the other looks like a, a slob. They're wearing the same suit because one of them is excellent. They've taken the steps to look excellent. Proverbs 13, 4 says, uh, Proverbs 14, 23, sorry says, in all labor, there's profit, but empty chatter leads only onto, onto poverty. So, you have to be intentional in how you, you carry yourself before people. It's important. It's very important. Working hard. The Bible says that um, if you see a man who is diligent in his work, he'll stand before kings. So there has to be this level of diligence. The Bible says the hand of the diligent will bear rule. The hand of the diligent will bear rule. And the hand of the slothful will be forced, will, will be put to forced labor. God's not going to promote a lazy person. Laziness, the Bible says, the, the lazy man will suffer hunger. Idleness will bring you into a place of need. God condemns laziness throughout the entire Bible. Old Testament and New Testament. The Bible says the lazy man is like a door set on its hinges. It just goes, a door set on a hinge. It can only go left and right. It doesn't go forward. It's set. It's it's secured in the ground. In the same vein, a lazy man who turns on his bed is, is the same way. Doesn't go anywhere in life. Can't move forward. Every person Jesus called to the ministry, they were doing something. When he promoted them into the call of ministry, they were doing something. James and John were mending nets. Peter and Andrew were casting nets. Matthew was tax collecting. They were all working at something. Paul was not some lazy bum that had, he was on, even though he was wicked and what he was doing was wicked, he was on his way to Damascus. He was zealous. He was zeal. He had zeal for what he was doing. God cannot promote laziness. It's against the laws of promotion. The Bible says, that um, is, it, it, do you see a man who's faithful in a little? He will be entrusted over much. Those are seven steps you have to take to ensure divine promotion. 
Seven steps that are necessary if you're going to walk in divine promotion, if God's going to take you to the next level. And I, say it, I said it before, it doesn't matter if man sees the steps you're taking. Don't just take these steps when, you, when you're trying to be noticed by man. God, no, Job, the Bible says, God took nob, note of Job. He said, seest thou a man like Job? A man who's blameless, who eschews evil and walks in, with integrity in all his ways? Do you, is there any man like that? Jo, God took note of Job. God will take note of you. So don't get discouraged. Nobody ever sees my hard work. Who cares? God sees your hard work. And if God sees your hard work, it's only a matter of time where he starts to lift you up. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for everyone that's tuned in today that a grace would come on them to follow these steps. A grace to carry out your specific instructions that would lead to unprecedented increase. In Jesus' name, burn out the chaff of laziness. Burn out indifference. Burn out from us laziness or anything that would keep us from obtaining the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Like, like Paul said, put in us a grace to not look at those things which are behind, but to press, put a press in our spirit to obtain the prize that you have for us. That we would not come short or fall short in anything. In Jesus' name, I pray, let there be a release over your people that are watching right now. A release for the, of the spirit of excellence. That go above and beyond. That like Jesus said, if, you're, if someone asks you a, a, a cloak, give him both your tunics. If he asks you to go one mile, go two miles. I pray let there be a release of the Daniel level of excellence that caused him to be distinguished in his generation to distinguish your people in our generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay connected with us by visiting us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching at TJ Malkanji. Or visit us online, www.salvationnow.ca. God bless you, and until next time.